I do not enjoy covering this era of politics, but the audiences and the voters seem to be more engaged in it than, say, 2004, when I might have enjoyed covering it more. So it's a complicated story, I think. If someone is shooting at me with a gun, I'm going to run. Like, I am engaged. You know what I mean? Right. <laughs> so, but, that's, right. that's not the ideal form of yes, engagement, yes, yes, right? right? A like striking, fear... new, striking new get-out-the-vote proposal, you know? <laughs> That's how it feels, literally, I think, for a lot yeah. of people. It, it feels like you and your family are uh, at risk. Um, and I guess I just wonder, I mean, two things. First is, how are you going to do this differently in your own head to manage your own sanity, right? Because we know this is toxic, this stuff. Not just Trump, but the whole thing. Just the way politics is being practiced right now in the United States. And there's a lot of evidence for that, right? So how are you going to manage it in your own head? And also, how are you going to cover it and still try to be useful despite all of these maddening challenges. This is Impromptu from Washington Post Opinions. It's a brand new show where we take you into the conversations behind the columns. Each week, we have different columnists who are best suited to discuss the news of the moment. I'm Amanda Ripley, and this week we're talking about the very unusual, yet somehow painfully familiar 2024 presidential campaign. I'm joined by two of my colleagues. You guys want to introduce yourselves? I'm Perry Bacon. I'm a columnist here at The Washington Post. I'm Jim Garrity. I'm a contributing columnist here at The Post. Okay, so Perry and Jim, you both have covered a lot of presidential campaigns. And here we are, kicking it up for another one. This time around, one poll shows that more than half of Americans feel dread, exhaustion, and depression as they look towards it. And I can relate. And I wonder... Can you, how are you both feeling as journalists and humans and Americans about the 2024 election? Yeah, Amanda, honestly, I really was hoping I'd be covering a better, happier, cheerier uh, presidential election, not one in which people were choosing between the lesser of two evils, or as that common saying goes, the evil of two lessers, uh, and just finding somebody they can feel enthusiastic about. And while you can find Democrats who like Joe Biden, You can find a lot who think he's really old and worry about him serving a full second term. Uh, But Trump's driven out a bunch of people who used to be Republicans and who are now, uh, I I certainly classify myself as a conservative independent to the Republican Party. I didn't leave it. It left me. Um, And then there are people in the middle who never liked either one of these guys and would desperately love to have somebody who does not uh, sound like the 90s movie Grumpy Old Men. <laughs> I This is the first repeat election I've covered, and I guess it's probably the first for a lot of people. This is, a, this is a sort of unusual historically to have. Very few of today's campaign correspondents were there for the Grover Cleveland uh, re-election bid. <laughs> I'm dreading it. I I didn't, you know, like I used to be someone who was very excited about, I'm going to Iowa. There's all these candidates to cover. This time... Um, there was a Republican primary, but I was fairly certain it wouldn't be competitive. And I don't want it, I don't like to go to places that sort of make up drama when there is none on some level. And so I am dreading this. I think it's really about Trump. And I think that's because he's like, if it was Joe Biden against Nikki Haley, I think my friends would not be coming up to me. Oh my God, is Nikki Haley going to win? I think there'd be less of that. And if it was like Trump against Andy Bashir or Gretchen Whitmer, I think my friends would still be as worried because it's still I think that, like, you know, people are not excited about Biden. I'll concede that as well. I'm, I'm on the left. I'll be voting for Biden more than Trump, obviously. But I still think it's like Trump creates this sense of crisis, one, for a lot of people on the left, particularly. And then two, I think for everybody, he, he's sort of a politician who's not about ideas or policies in a certain way. So he creates this sort of reductive, hate him, love him conversation that's not about. Trump, to his defense, does actually have ideas, but I feel like the campaign becomes caught up in what he said, mar lago who's he going to pick for VP, who's who's so-and-so's nickname, who's he think is ugly. Like, it, it's sort of like d- divine. I didn't like George W. Bush, but I actually thought the campaign, he had ideas, and people covered his ideas in a certain way. This is like a much more reductive, boring, stupid version of politics that I also hate. <laughs> Look, you know, it, Trump com- of 2024 compared to the Trump of 2020 or the Trump of 2016, um, he's got January 6th hanging over him. He's got four criminal indictments hanging over him. Uh, you look at what he, you know, the typical rantings on truth social, you can make an argument that he's even more nuts now 
than he was four years ago or eight years ago. Uh, he certainly spends much less time talking about the border wall and and uh, uh, Muslim ban. Or, like, like whether you think they're good ideas or bad ideas, they're ideas. Much more of his campaign is about him and how they went out and they screwed me and they're allowed to get me. It's the deep state and all that stuff. It is a self-referential campaign. Um, Joe Biden is four years older, and I don't think it is being mean or harsh to say he shows every one of those uh, 81 years that the, the presidency ages every man. And it's certainly not like the last three years have been easy, smooth sailing for, for the country or for the president. So I, I, we're ne- we've always known that negative partisanship and this uh, being driven by the fear of the other party getting in control was becoming the most powerful influence in our politics. It now feels like it's the, the, the primary influence in our politics. It's like the, the dominant, overwhelming one. So that's where we are, America. Good luck. Yeah. Yeah. And it's funny, right? You talk about negative partisanship and and it goes back to your point about about uh, former President Trump being very, very triggering <laughs> for many, many people, right? And, you know, I mean, look, it's a dysfunctional relationship. That's I feel like we're in a dysfunctional relationship uh, with this particular candidate in this country. And so normally, what do you do in a dysfunctional relationship? Like normally you try to distance yourself from that person. You try to create boundaries. I mean, there's a whole kind of playbook for dealing with extreme narcissists. And so the question is, how do you do that when that person is running for president? How do you, as journalists, not just amplify uh, the crazy? How do you possibly be of use to your to your readers, right? And I'm really curious about how we can do this thing differently, if we can do this thing differently in our own lives and in the work that we do. So I guess, uh, I think this, I was in a different job, working at 538, and it's around 2019. And our and my editor's like, we're going to have a live blog about the Trump uh, State of the Union address. And I was kind of like thinking, why am I dreading this so much? And I was like, oh, I actively try to avoid Trump speeches. Like at this point, you know, there's so much hysteria around him. He's sort of being inflammatory intentionally. It was my it's my job to know what he's saying. I often read the transcript after, but that's a different experience than watching him give speeches. I, you know, I used to be a cable news pundit. I gradually wound down from watching cable news, you know, in that 2017 to 2020 period for the same reason. Trump is sort of like in this sort of weird relationship with the media where we need him, he needs us, but it, but it's bad for everybody on some level. So I think I've gotten to a more extreme point now myself to where when my wife and I are going to have dinner with our couple, I will usually email uh, the usually the man because usually he wants to do it and say, hey, you know, I try to avoid talking about politics during non work time because I worked at five. Wait, 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 wait. Can I just sure. make sure I understand? This is really interesting. Yeah. So you're saying if you're going to have dinner with another couple, yes. is that what yes, you mean? Yes, another couple. And will, so before yes. you kind of want to set the stage, because people are going to naturally talk to you to about me, politics, yeah, yes, right? Cause I, but but just of my like job. we're torturing you right, right. now. <laughs> I get, I'm getting paid for this. <laughs> to be clear. So, you know, so that's okay, the right, right. distinction. Okay. So, uh, okay, so, sorry. I just wanted to go no, ahead. No, no, but I think it's important, like, for me at least, because I worked, particularly since I worked at 538, where we're sort of labeled as election experts. And I, I guess I do know more about elections than the average person, but we're sort of eight years into the who's going to win Wisconsin being the second question I'm asked sometimes by close friends. That's, so that's personally, I, when I'm at the park with my daughter, I will really try to say, you know, who's going to win Michigan? Uh, we'll spend two minutes on this. And then I will like sort of set a timer occasionally. And sort of, and people are also very anxious. So if I say Trump is going to do do well, they become, I, I'm not trying to make them feel worse. I'm, you asked me by opinion, yeah. you asked me what I think. This is my job. I'm not for Trump, but if that is going to make you anxiety induced while at the park, I'd rather not say that to you. Mm-hmm. Yeah. In terms of how to cover it, on some level, I think, I've written seven years of pieces saying Donald Trump is bad. I don't have a whole lot to add. And I think a lot of people are writing Donald Trump is bad pieces. Go to Washington. Okay, so let me stop there. There are a lot of pieces <laughs> on how Donald Trump is bad. Okay, so I just recently did a piece about how the news media is kind of imploding, all these layoffs. So I tried to connect that and was like, okay, before the, the Trump bump was kind of saving the news media, but now there are news media layoffs happening even while Trump is... Um, running for president. So I'm trying to find ways to write about politics governing Trump and Biden that are not directly about Trump and Biden, because I don't have a lot more to add about Trump being a radical and Biden being old. I don't have a lot. Those are those things are true. But I and I also think, to be fair, 
I think 95% of the people in America probably already know who they're voting for. And I don't know how to reach that 5%. My sense is Joe Biden and Donald Trump don't really know either. And so in that sense, I'm not sure how much there is to say interesting directly about the choice, which seems fairly obvious to me and one we just had four years ago. Yeah. Okay. Before you, I want to hear what you think, Jim, but, but I just want to isolate. It sounds like you've said a couple of important things that people listening could take into their own lives. And one is you no longer engage with video and audio of politicians who, who make you feel deep despair. Um, and there's a lot of research that shows that you are correct to do that, that if you're going to try to be informed about what people are saying, then it's much better to read the transcript, right? Um, and then the other thing I heard you say is that you put um, limits on how much this is going to leak into your personal life, right? You try to create boundaries using a timer, which I love, and I'm sure that your daughter appreciates it as <laughs> well. Sure because my neighbors she do, probably but anyway. <laughs> does not care about this either, right? Um, so that's awesome. Um, and then in your work, you're trying really hard to figure out how not to just ruminate in the same uh, anger and, and fear that, that we're, we've felt for a long time and that uh, you've already expressed your concerns, right, and not just keep repeating them. Um, so I think that's something we could all, I'm writing this down for myself uh, <laughs> for the next few months here. Jim, I want to hear from you about your strategies and coping mechanisms. But first, we're going to take a quick break. And we're back. Jim, I want to go to you. How are you thinking about covering the election in a way that's helpful to your readers? Well, my primary solution to every challenge in life is heavy drinking. Uh, I highly recommend that. That's um, <laughs> This is the, the NBC, the more you know, uh, sort of uh, <laughs> right, right. helpful advice for kids. Just getting a little um, too impromptu. <laughs> <laughs> Perry, Perry made a reference to eight years. And, and one of the things I think were maybe, if people really feel like they're hitting their limit and, and that this, they've, they've kind of, you know, they can't take anymore. You know, previously in our politics, like the past generation or so, if somebody comes along who you can't stand, Bill Clinton, George W. Bush, Barack Obama, they go away in eight years. They, they come in and they serve and they serve eight years. And then by and large, they leave you alone. They do not come. Most of our former presidents are very quiet. Trump has not been that. Uh, and what's more is the prospect of if he wins the election, presuming he lives you know, throughout his full term and, you know, despite his age, he certainly seems to have a demonic stamina um, that he will be around in our lives until at least January 20th, 2029. And I, I podcast listeners, please do not consume the hemlock when I say that. Please do not uh, freak out when I say it. But like this, this, you know, like 12 years is a big chunk of somebody's life to be front and center. And as uh, no offense to Biden and all that stuff, but like pretty much since he came down that escalator in like what, June 2015, the biggest question in our lives has been, what do you think of Trump? And everybody figured out what they think of Trump if not within five minutes, because he already had like 99% name ID when he chose to run back in 2015. Um, maybe things have happened in the past. We're now going on eight years that might have changed your opinion one way or the other. Um, but I don't think many people have changed their minds. I, I think people who liked him still like him or lo people who love him still love him. People who didn't like him then grew to hate him, grew to loathe him. And now it's just nails across the chalkboard there. Um, and, you know, Perry and I see the world differently, but I, from reading his stuff, and I, I try to do the same thing, we in the news, I, Perry's always like told his listeners or, or readers what they need to hear, whether or not they want to hear it. And that's something I think we in the news business have to do, even though the temptation to toss out red meat or to, to say, to tell our readers what they want to hear uh, is always a, a great temptation. You get a lot of positive feedback when you do that. Um but sometimes you've got to hear your, eat your vegetables and you got to hear stuff that they don't want to hear. And I think that's a factor in why people aren't reading the news the way they used to. Um, maybe, you know, for the first term of Trump, there was a sense of, oh, you got to read the news because you got to see what this guy's up to. You know, if you like him, ah, what great thing is Trump going to do today? If you don't like him, how is Donald Trump going to destroy the country today? And I just think that after a while, like that kind of wears on people. Uh, when people say they don't want to listen to it, they don't want, okay, but- one way or another, somebody's taken the oath on January twentieth. Yeah, yeah. No, I think it's a, it's it's a it's a really tricky thing because we know you just you know when you mentioned Jim how long 
uh, Trump and Biden now have been in our uh, on our radar. It's it's particularly, um, I think, sort of damaging for young Americans, you know, because that's all they know is this kind of politics, right? This kind of us versus them, burn down the house politics. And we see that in the research that it's young Americans who are most distressed by politics and uh, politically engaged young Americans even more so. Um, so. So while, you know, we we laugh about it and we have our little ways to try to manage it, it is serious. You know, we know that uh, 5% of American adults report having had suicidal thoughts because of politics. Um, and this is not, this is not good, right? Like this is not, politics are supposed to make us feel like we have some small amount of power over our, our destiny. Um, but four out of 10 Americans are actively avoiding contact with the news, the thing that we produce. So um, I do think that this is a, an opportunity to do things a little bit wacky this year and try to be creative and try to be honest about our own struggle about it, right? As you both have been, that that there are things we wish were different, things that we miss, um, things that we're trying to figure out. Um, because we don't, like you said, Jim, we want to give people hard realities, right? And not shy away from that. But to do that in a mm. way that is provokes curiosity mm. as opposed to disengagement and depression is the real challenge. Um, Perry, do you have anything to add before we before we wrap up here? The other thing I, I, I struggle with a lot is like, what is the nature of this conflict? Like, there are high conflict moments that are, there were high conflicts in the 1860s and the 1960s, and I wouldn't be here on this podcast if people were not willing to engage in those conflicts. Me Too was a high conflict moment. I'm glad that happened. The 2020 protests were high conflict. I'm glad those happened. What... I'm what I find to be different about this is the sort of like blue, red, dim Republican conflict is at times like reductive and not about anything. And people are sort of arguing like it's the Chiefs versus the 49ers and there's no substance to it. And then other times I think. Like the debate over how we teach race, race and education in southern states or in, is actually about something like they are trying to ban ideas that I think are important to understanding racial where we are in terms of race. So part of my challenge is I don't some people come up to me and talk about Trump are deeply or Biden are deeply concerned about they feel like the America they want is going away from them. And I don't want to minimize that conflict and, I, and that's and something I struggle with is like, are we in a 1850s style conflict to where it's inevitable, it's exhausting, but it's also really important. Are we fighting over the soul of America? I'm not comparing Trump to slavery, obviously, but I do think the conflict and the sort of value differences between mm -hmm. the parties are actually pretty important. Yeah. And I get exactly what you're saying, that there is this weird way in which the debate feels absurd and also really high stakes and serious. Anyway, thank you both so much for, for having this conversation. I, I know that we're going to keep having it in our own heads and with each other in the months to come. Um, and we hope that we will hear from, from listeners and readers as well about how they are coping uh, this year and what they have learned about how to stay a little engaged, but not just be um, running for our lives. Thank you both. Thank you. Thanks, Amanda. This episode of Impromptu was produced by Hadley Robinson. It was edited by Damir Marusik, Chris Sullentrop, and Allison Michaels, and mixed by Emma Munger. Chris Rukin designed our art. Special thanks to Millie Mitra, Nick Safin, Renita Jablonski, and David Shipley. Find Impromptu wherever you get your podcasts. If you like the show, please follow it so you don't miss an episode. And if you really like the show, rate us or leave a review. It really helps us spread the word. Thanks. Thanks.